And thank you for tuning in to the Hot Rod Bible Study tonight. Again, tonight we are going to go through an entire book of the Bible, as we did last week with uh, Third John. Again, it's because it's a whopping 13 verses, so there we are. Uh, but before we go ahead and, and do that, I'd like to share with you something as we put on my heart today. Uh, I think that we can all agree that uh, what happened this past Tuesday in, in Texas was uh, not only shocking, but just despicable. And I think everybody's heart breaks over what happened. Now, of course, with this happening, everything now comes up on social media and everybody has their different ideas on what to do to rid ourselves forever of this problem. Well, uh, until God gets put back in the schools, I don't know how that's going to happen. But again, you can agree or disagree with me on that. Uh, one thing that also happens uh, when times like this, there are people, believers, who post something on social media that says, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, the families and everything. And it's heartfelt. It is heartfelt. Those of us who believe that, ch that prayer is effective. Okay. What really got me this time, and it really took me by surprise, are the responses to those posts about thoughts and prayers going out to these individuals. Things like, well, what God are you praying to? Are you going to pray to the God that allowed it to happen or the God that didn't do anything to fix it? Or why are we even doing anything, dealing anything with this 2,000 year old fairy tale? And I'm thinking, my goodness. You know, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go to battle here and, and reply in kind. Uh, but, you know, we are to speak the truth in love. And case in point, uh, there's a friend of mine by the name of Mike Booker. Now, some of you guys who are drag racing fans might recognize the name. His dad was, Jim Booker, who uh, won the Summer Nationals in 1975 in a Chevrolet-powered top fuel car. Uh, I believe that sometime throughout the year, I don't know if, whether he held, it was a national record that he held, whether it was ET or mile an hour, I don't remember. But anyway, Mike also drives top fuel car, okay? Uh, and he's blessed to get a ride here and there. You know, he doesn't have a major funded team or anything like that. But Mike's biggest thing is that Mike is a Calvary Chapel pastor in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. Yesterday, he posts something concerning how the regular Wednesday night service was going to be, the format was going to be changed. They're going to have a, a short message and then open it up for a time for prayer for our country, which our country desperately needs. And the response that he got from one guy telling him that you can shove your prayers up your and that it's your effing God that caused, you know, all this stuff and goes on and on. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. Now, Mike did an excellent job of speaking the truth in love. Somebody pointed it out and he said, look, I obviously heard him. The guy's, the guy's messed up. But for Mike to do as we are called to do, which is to speak the truth in love, it was a, it was a great example for many. And that's what as we as Christians are called to do in instances such as this. Okay. Uh, there will be a big debate, I'm sure, uh, in the coming weeks concerning what should be done. Uh, but again, the responses to people uh, saying that they're praying just really took me by surprise. And the thing that really got me on this is faceplant hasn't taken it off. You know, my daughter got thrown in faceplant jail for posting that boys are gross. You know, and for she has a 24 hour Facebook jail for saying that boys are gross. And like she says, obviously the fact checkers, the people they said because it was hate speech. The people who are saying that obviously haven't raised little boys. It's a known fact. They're gross. I was gross as a little boy. Give me a break. But I went and checked today, just a little bit before this broadcast. 
And they haven't pulled down what that guy had to say. Filthy language and taking God's name in vain, the whole thing. We in this country need prayer. Uh, we're in a mess. Uh, and it's time for us Christians to stand up and also, again, do it by speaking the truth in love. And that's going to be the hard part. Because you probably want to react like I want to react with some smart aleck remark and maybe some filthy language. But count on the Holy Spirit and speak the truth in love. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled program of uh, 3 John. Would you join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time where we get to spend together in your word. We thank you for your word to be able to spend time in. We thank you that your word is not, as the one man said, a bunch of fairy tales, but your word is the truth. Lord, I pray for all of those who are affected by the shooting in Texas, I pray for our nation that we would turn back towards you, turn our faces towards you instead of having our backs toward you, soften the hearts of all those whose hearts have been hardened toward you. It's just like the Israelites in the Old Testament whose hearts were hardened and you gave them over to their own desires. Lord, I pray that you just soften the hearts of those in our country. Again, be with us tonight in our study. Open our hearts and minds. And as, as always, keep me out of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Third John is, again, a letter or an epistle, if you will. And as most letters or epistles are written to try to correct some sort of... Uh, heresy, some sort of false teaching, some sort of false teachers. Uh, we think about Paul in his letter to the Galatians, where he was addressing the Judaizers, those who thought that, gee, it's great that you know Jesus as the Messiah, but for you to really be saved, you got to follow all the, the uh, traditions and regulations. Guys, you got to go out and get modified. Gals, you can't do anything but wear dresses, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, and he addressed that. Now, it's one thing to have to address outside influences on the church. Uh, John's letter here addresses somebody who is in the church, who is making mistakes, bad influence, bad example. So uh, with that, let's take a look. Again, 3 John verse 1 says, The elder to beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all the things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified to the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth in his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers in truth. Pardon me, for the truth. I wrote to the church, uh, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, pratting against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with a pen and ink, but I hope to see you in shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you 
Greet the friends by name. Okay. Again, he starts off, John starts off this letter by saying the elder, referring to himself. Now, in the Greek, it's presbyter, which means priest, pastor. Also could refer to the fact that our buddy John is kind of long in the tooth by now. He's over 90 years old. And he's identifying himself as such. Last week, uh, he did not identify whom he was writing the letter to. And he didn't identify himself either. And the big deal was uh, right about that time, 90 to 100 A.D., right around that time, uh, Christians were being persecuted, and I mean persecuted more than being put in face plant jail, but being uh, beheaded and crucified. So they kind of, the letter was written so as not to get people beheaded or crucified. Uh, it's kind of like today when we pray for those who are missionaries in countries that, uh, oh, if they find out you're a Christian, you're done, but they need to be there. So that kind of deal. But tonight we see that he writes to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now this may or may not be the same Gaius that Paul wrote about in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Um, Gaius was a fairly common Roman name. Uh, <laughs> I was just thinking today, we go out to lunch with three Dans, and we number them, one, two, and three. They get a food order, it says, is this Dan one? Or, but like, kind of like that. So here's Gaius, you know, they probably have Gaius one, two, and three there too. But it goes on, whom I love in truth. What is truth? And this is an issue that we're dealing with right now, today, with all the baloney going on about that terrible thing that happened in Texas. What is truth? Well, the truth is Jesus Christ. The truth is his word is inerrant. Okay, we can go from there and find out. Test these other things by Jesus. Okay. Verse 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. You know, we can be in good physical health and our soul be in rotten shape or vice versa. There are people whose souls are just beautiful or in terrible physical health. You think about, I, I read all the time stories about, especially little old ladies who are just a joy to be around who can barely walk or speak or anything like that, then, but they love the Lord so much that they just exude happiness. Okay, so here's John saying, boy, I pray that you prosper and be in health and your soul being prosperous too, both your physical and soul well-being. Verse 3 says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth, namely Jesus, that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. Okay, people from that Gaius had um, uh, run into, that's not the word I'm searching for, but the people knew Gaius and they recognized Jesus in him and came back to where John was writing this, more than likely uh, is figured to be in Ephesus, okay, and reported the church up oh, what a what a good, strong believer Gaius is. It says, just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Gaius being somebody whom uh, remember John's John's uh, 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 phrase his um huh, there it is. You know, this losing easy words to say, his term of endearment, there it is, came fairly quick. His term of endearment is always calling people dear, dear children, right? So all of these, and of course he's old enough to say this, all of these believers he figures as his children in Christ. Okay, and this is walk in truth. Again, not just bask in the truth but walk in the truth as well. Not just um, know Jesus as your Savior, but follow him as your Lord as well. You know, 
I happen to be the first one to admit there was a time in my life when I just knew him as my Savior and did not follow him as my Lord. And this was not a good example. This was not walking in the truth. Verse 5 says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren, talking to Gaius, who have borne witness of your love before the church. Again, that church more than likely in Ephesus. If you send them, those people that bore witness and others, uh, forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well. It, it's kind of like uh, Jesus says in the parable of the talents in uh, Matthew 25, as during the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You do well when you do that. Okay. Verse 7, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. In other words, not being influenced by non-believers. Okay, we go, we back up. What's, what's John been writing about? These non-believers that are having an effect on the church, outwardly affecting the church. So these people didn't take anything from the non-believers. Verse 8 says, we therefore ought to receive such, these people, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And you recognize fellow workers by the truth that is in them. Here it is, Matthew 10, verse 40 and 41 says, he who receives you receives me. Talking about John telling Gaius to receive these guys. He receives me, receives him who sent me. He receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Okay, receiving them as such. Verse 9, I wrote to the church about Diotrephes. But he loves to have the preeminence among them and does not receive us. Oh, Willie, how could this happen? How could somebody be in the church and do this? Well, you know, here's the thing. Churches are run by what? Men. Now, I'm not just talking about men. and I'm talking about men and women as mankind. Okay, run the church. What are men inherently, what do men inherently do? Sin. Oh no. Now get you know it's all because it's all because of environment that people go bad. It's you no, know, they're born they're born so innocent they it's all because of environment they go bad. How about Adam and Eve? <laughs> what sort of environment were they in? They were able to walk in the cool of the evening with God in the garden. I think that was just an oppressive environment, and that's why they rebelled against God. No, God gave us free will, and unfortunately, we've chosen to rebel. Rebel. So you get people in the church who do this, and this guy really, this guy really, this diatrophies really reminds me of a guy fresh out of seminary that Pam and I dealt with some years ago. We were a part of a really neat. Really neat little church in Ukiah, California. And I mean, people would walk in there and first thing they'd say, Oh, this church is so loving. That was Pam's and my experience when we first walked in. And it's right. Everybody there was so loving, loved the Lord and loved people. And there for a period of time, about nine years, we were uh, under the, uh, a really strong, in missional type work, uh, pastor whom I grew exponentially in my faith. As a matter of fact, he was the one who encouraged me to get more involved in ministry. He went to a, a took a different call, and for the first year or two, things were along ran pretty smoothly. We had an, an intentional interim guy. <laughs> Things went pretty smoothly except for the month that I was the the pastor there. <laughs> but anyway, it, it was it was a good, great con congregation. Uh a couple of years down the road, ends up 
getting this young man fresh out of seminary. And we thought, boy, this will be really good. And I thought, okay, I can convey to him the uh, culture of our congregation. Okay, this was a Lutheran church, but it wasn't necessarily, this is the baby duty stings kind of Lutheran church. Okay. Well, turns out this new guy is a, this is a way we do these things kind of guy. I saw him deny a man communion at the communion rail. I saw him, oh, well, many things. And I had a talk with him one time. I said, what do you want? Do you want a church full of believers or a pew full of good Lutherans? And he said he'd take a pew full of good Lutherans. Sounds just like this Diotrephes guy. Because here he was, loves to have the preeminence among them. He called himself Mr. Absolution Man and does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does prating against us. It not only, with malicious words, not only is he not accepting people that John, wait a minute, who do you think, who do you think you really ought to listen to? You ought to listen to this Young guy who doesn't know what's going on, or a guy that actually witnessed the crucifixion, who actually spent a good three years with Jesus, who actually was boiled in oil prior to this because of his faith. Who do you listen to? Well, this guy didn't. Okay, And not only that, he was sending away people who did. And do not contend with that. He himself does not receive the brethren, again, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Boyce puts it this way, to begin with, a man named Diotrephes had assumed an unwarranted and pernicious authority in the church, so much so that by the time of the writing of this letter, John's own authority had been challenged. And those who had been sympathetic to John had been excommunicated from the local assembly. Moreover, due to this struggle, traveling missionaries had been rudely treated, including probably an official delegation from John. Somebody who got inside the church and got in a position of power and ruined the church. Happens today. My example was just one of many. I've heard this happen now and again. The problem ends up happening a lot of times is you find some guy who is charismatic, and uh, everybody loves right off the bat, and they get pretty full of themselves, and they don't. They're, <laughs> people are following the following a pastor, not following Jesus, and that creates a great big problem. This is a bad example of a pastor. Diotrephes is a bad example. Gaius, it's a good example. What happened? People will come and talk to John, tell him about what a great job he's doing, how he walks in the truth. Verse 11 goes on to say, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, this Diotrephes guy, but what is good, like, like, like Gaius. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Hmm. Verse 12, Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Uh, Demetrius is being um, recommended by John as the guy to fill in, to <laughs> take over from this Diotrephes guy once they give him the boot. You know, and it's a good possibility that Demetrius is the guy who delivered this letter. Remember, they didn't have. Air, uh, they didn't. They didn't have uh, air mail or trains or Pony Express or anything. Most of, most letters were delivered by guys on foot. Okay, so that's more than likely this Demetrius guy. John closes by saying, "I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face." This is the same way he closed his letter uh, in Second John. We don't know whether or not he was able to go meet with them face to face. I would hope so. Uh, it, that's what happens. It's we we're just talking before uh, tonight's broadcast about if you got something you got to take care of, it's a lot better to go eyeball to eyeball than to try and do it over the telephone or 
in this case, through letters and all. It's better to go eyeball to eyeball. It says here, peace to you. Again, shalom. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. You know, he's saying, boy, we love you guys. Say hi to everybody for us. Um, usually, I will read, if I read a psalm, I'll read it at the beginning of the broadcast. But tonight, I'm going to do something a little different. I'd like to read the 23rd Psalm. Why? Well, because it's a psalm of comfort. I think that all those who are hurting right now need to hear this. I know I do. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Questions, comments, or smart aleck remarks? Again, uh, if you want to argue with me, I'm up for it. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.